Perfect. Awesome. First of all, welcome everyone to our virtual lunch in Kenya. Um, it's so great to see everyone joining us. We actually have people from all over the world. I can see somebody from Liberia, Rwanda, Kenya, um, Sri Lanka. I'm from Ontario. So it's pretty cool to see everyone joining us here today. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Um, my name is Carrie Roberts. You might have seen me in the bottom of your emails. Um, I am the Communications and Donor Engagement Manager here at Thrive for Good. Um, I have been working with Thrive for about four years now, and I'll always remember the first time I actually met Dale and Linda Bolton, who are the founders of Thrive, and ever since them, then I've been so inspired and encouraged by what they are doing and started in East Africa. So for today, I'm going to be the facilitator of this meeting. And as you may have seen, I have actually put everybody on mute. Um, this is so that we don't run into any sound interruptions during the meeting, um, especially when we're hearing from our members of the executive team in Kenya. Um, we do ask that you respect that and you do not unmute yourself. Um, that will help us have a smooth process as we go about this meeting. So for the first part, we are actually going to be hearing from two of our members in Kenya, um, Ambrose and Raphael. They will share a little bit about an update from the field and then um, how they have been working during the COVID pandemic. Uh, and then the second part, we are actually going to open it up to a question and answer session where you will have the opportunity to ask questions uh, that you may have about the organization. So the way we're gonna be doing that is you can submit um, your questions using the Zoom group chat feature. So if you're looking on your screen, it might be different depending on what device you are on. You can look, for me, it's at the bottom middle where it says chat. You can click on that and you can type in your questions at any point during the meeting. Um, and we will do our best to get to your questions and answer them near the end of the meeting today. All right. Um, before we get started, I do want to share that this is our first time ever doing something like this, so it's very exciting. Um, I do want to apologize in advance if we do run into some technical errors, but we do hope it's a smooth process and you enjoy your time with us today. Um, and then finally, that we did schedule this meeting from 12 to 1 p.m. EST, Eastern Standard Time. Um, but our team is flexible with the time and we will be able to stay on a little bit after 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, if there are still some more questions. But for you, if you have um, a cutoff time, feel free to exit the meeting at any time. Um, we will not be offended. So if you need to leave, just go ahead and do so. Um, that being said, I think I covered everything. I would like to introduce Ambrose. He is our CEO. CEO in Kenya, and he's been working alongside Thrive for, I think, just over 10 years now. He's been there since the beginning with Dale. Um, so, Ambrose, yeah, take it away. I'm going to unmute you here for a minute. Good. Okay. Uh, thank Thanks, you, Kerry. And hi, everyone. Yeah, it's a pleasure meeting all of you from all over the world. I think, as Kerry said, this is our first uh, such a meeting which is a privilege. And uh, I just want to say who I am. As Kerry said, I'm Ambrose Motian. I'm the CEO of Drive here in Kenya. I started all the way with uh, Drive in 2009. But initially, how it came to me to be in Drive, I happened to meet Dell in uh, 2008 in Manor House Agricultural Center, where I was also taking a course on biointensive agriculture. And uh, when we met with Dell, it was like a miracle because the vision that he had and the vision that I had after I did my course was to go and help my community. So we had a chat with Mr. Dell, the founder, and uh, I told him the vision that I had and also he shared what he wanted to do. And it seems like we matched the vision that we had for the communities. And uh, for me, I saw whatever I was doing and uh, whatever I'm doing is a call to me because everybody has been called to serve in different ways. 
And uh, for me, I was called to serve the community. So that's my passion. And uh, I tried so many things until that time, 2008, when I met Dell, and the vision that I had came true. So I was very, very glad uh, for, for the opportunity that I was given by the founders, at least to be part of the family of Drive for Good, initially called Organics for Orphans, and I, I was happy for that opportunity. So, and being an opportunity and my passion, it's because my background, uh, I came from a, a village and we practiced farming. My parents are farmers. And uh, I used to have this knowledge of farming, though it was just conventional way of farming and keeping animals. But with the new knowledge that I acquired on how we can train the community to use the locally available materials and also use the, all the available space and also eating healthy and growing, uh, uh, growing different medicinal plants, I felt that this is what my community really wanted for them to grow healthy and also to, to thrive. So having said so, uh, I've been involved with Drive, as I said, for the last 10 years. And I've, I've always been happy when I see touching people's lives and touching people's lives whereby by empowering them with our programs that we are advocating here at Drive. And we are empowering them, at least they can grow their own food, foods that can uh, eradicate uh, disease or uh, prevent diseases. And we are calling them disease fighting foods because by the end of the day, we want to see that we have disease free communities. And by doing so, empowering them, we are planting that hope to them. And later we are seeing the the, the 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 hope or we have seen the 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 answers on what we are doing so we are planting uh, hope and harvesting change so it's all about uh, changing those communities or different communities so and having been involved in this work for a long time we have done marvelous job in the field different communities different countries and we have impacted a lot of people. And many people are talking about the, how we should go. And organic farming is the way to go. You all know right now the problem that we have in the world, this pandemic of COVID. And people are talking about eating healthy, growing their own food. And it has been a challenge to most of the people getting this food and also affecting people in different way. And like here in Drive, we have been affected in one way or another one, especially when it comes to our trainings. And we used to have trainings four times in a year, but you see now we can't do in-house training because traveling restrictions by government, also gathering people is a problem. But as an organization and as a leadership team, we thought on how we can impact, we can continue impacting these people for they cannot come here and learn from our training center. And we came up with this idea of establishing an online training. And most of you are aware that it has just, we have just launched it uh, a few days ago and it is doing very well. And most of the people are really happy of what we have come up with. And for us as staffs, especially here in Kenya, it has been a learning process too, because this is something new. And as we are seeing uh, nowadays, we are going with the new normal. And the new normal is to go how things are. With this COVID, we have to become more innovative. We have to see how we can do things differently. And on our online training, we have come up with uh, uh, 40 chapters and over eight lessons with videos whereby students can learn from wherever they are. They just log in and they can learn on how, one, they can grow their food organically, two, they can uh, learn more on nutrition, three, disease prevention, and also in income generation. And from the look of the things where we are, like 
recently the government of Kenya was talking about empowering people on how they can grow their own food and also are talking about the foods that they should eat and this is all what we have been doing and advocating as drive for the last uh, over uh, last uh, 10 years or more and now most of the governments and the people are realizing that this is the way to go and that's why as drive we are very very proud of that so uh, you see the government was talking about giving out kits for growing for people to grow their own food which is the right way to go but also as drive despite the restrictions the online training is also trying to help people on how they can learn and start growing their own food and also eating healthy and also using some of the medicinal plants that are locally in their in their in their homes so or in their communities so that's what has been uh, has been happening and with this pandemic we see that at least people's lives have changed and as i said earlier it's time everybody now is realizing the importance of uh, growing high nutritious food growing their own food and also trying to keep healthy so that to fight most of these diseases especially the covid 19. that's what they are uh, advocating for and saying that it is good that you uh, you boost your immune system and fight the diseases. And here in Kenya, and as we, the situation is, we have our field staff all over or in most of the communities, and they are still trying to keep on and train these people and support them in one way or another in running their projects because they have the life gardens and the oats and the interns that we have in the communities they are trying their level best with this situation to make sure that at least they give that support even though not the way they used to do earlier before this pandemic but at least something is coming up and we have been seeing good reports positive reports on how people are communicating and like recently we had a certain lady from Nairobi that is the capital city of of Kenya and she heard about us and the work that we are doing and she happened to go to a doctor and one of the doctor uh, just advised her it is good that if with this situation if it is good to take if you can get artemisia it is good that you be taking artemisia and it will be boosting your immune system and the lady got our conducts and we had to get for her some artemisia and send her to Nairobi so people are coming to realize all these things and that's why we are proud of and people's lives are changing and as people's lives are changing also in some communities lives are becoming more difficult recently i visited one of uh, my farm and i could see that community or that village how they were suffering i could see that they couldn't afford even a meal or or two meals a day and i happened to ask one of the lady uh, how many times do you have your meals and uh, the lady could tell me only once that's supper only because most of the people with this situation and how life has changed most of the people in the villages are used to hand to mouth they have to work during the day then get something and then they can put something on the table and one of the thing that we are seeing and uh, i challenged have been challenging them and some of them are adapting is that if you can grow your own food emulate from what you are seeing i'm doing in my farm then you can have food every day especially nutritious uh, food and i'm happy to say here that people around my farm they have started adapting this organic farming at least even though they are not doing the it perfectly but at least something is coming and you could hear most of the people are talking about the way to go recently just on monday i had another friend of mine and said you guys you are doing the right thing this is what is needed right now growing your food organically boosting your immune system and then just that's what is needed and he told me we wish we knew this sometimes back long away 
or uh, sometimes back. We could have been practicing this, but unfortunately, we are coming to realize when uh, uh, later. But I told him it is not late. Still, you can grow your own food. So that's that's what people are seeing now. And I think as a team here at Drive and the people in the field, what we are trying to advise people and to uh, create awareness to people is it's not yet late you can grow your own food anywhere you can boost your immune system by eating healthy food you can grow your medicinal uh, plants to boost your immune system and to do away with some of the diseases and also the surplus you can sell after you have put enough on your table and sell and then you can just do other things so that's now income generation and i'm happy with the support that you are giving us on the other end it is coming up very well we are supporting a lot of communities and the way we are at, uh, we are giving out our information everybody is happy about it and very impressive and at least right now we can say the communities are accepting and are embracing our work on what we are doing uh, in eradicating poverty and also making sure that we have disease free communities so i just want to stop there and usher in my colleague uh, just to say something and that is uh, Mr. Raphael. Raphael, maybe from where I've stopped, you can just add something about what's happening on uh, in our field. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ambrose. That was good. Thank you. Um, forgive me, my internet is not very stable. I'm still at home. Uh, my home is uh, near the uh, the mountains. You know, I come from out Kenya, and uh, we don't have uh, fiber internet. We still are uh, still using the I think there's 2G, I don't know, or 3G. It's poor, but uh, I bet you can hear me. Uh, thank you, Kerry, for facilitating this. I was just looking at the names on the screen. You know, I'm looking at everyone here. We have about uh, 28 participants online. And this looks like a UN, you know, UN General Assembly. We have people from all over the world. And this is very, very nice. Uh, Ambrose has stopped much. He has stopped a lot. Uh, I'll just give um, a wrap up, you know, on what is going on, uh, especially in East and uh, Central Africa, because we have Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and DRC. And uh, I've seen we also have a guy here, uh, Ernest from Liberia. Uh, basically, uh, you know, the world is suffering from this pandemic, and um, we are having uh, curfews, restrictions, and uh, lockdowns across across board. Even though I've seen that uh, some countries are easing, uh, you know, restrictions. Like in Kenya, we now have our flights back. I saw New Zealand uh, people going to watch a football match. Uh, on our projects, we had a meeting um, yesterday. We were discussing we, the coordinators, you know, on a formula to reopen and uh, go back to work, uh, start, uh, uh, you know, continue with where we left in uh, in February. This doesn't mean that we stopped everything, but we had to ease some of the operations. If you looked at, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the notes that we took from that meeting, uh, the country coordinators are only discussing about projects. Uh, this was we didn't expect this because we assumed that because uh, you know countries are having lockdowns, they're having uh, you know restrictions, social distancing, and all these other type of uh, you know uh, curfews. We thought uh, that uh, we might not be. You know, we may not disperse a lot of funds for projects, but uh, the irony is that people need more, you know, more more tools. They want more more seeds. Uh, they want to do more. Communities. Uh, it seems that because schools are closed and more kids are at home, and uh, incomes incomes people are not earning because there's no business, no work. Uh, people are becoming. Uh, the need for support is even increasing as compared to previous uh you know as compared to the same time last year or as compared to the first quarter this year and uh this has definitely uh changed the ball game if you look at um a country like congo uh where um you know uh, incomes are very low and uh poverty is very high uh the coordinators are only asking for for more seeds and for more tools 
if you look at the the gentlemen from uh, uh, like you know the coordinators from Rwanda, all of them are asking for more seeds and, and more tools. Um, I bet we'll have to shift some of our you know uh, our, vo our our resources from other uh, votes you know from other um, uh, budgeted allocations to, to 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 seeds and to to inputs and all these other you know needs for the project. Uh, I don't want to speak much. I know that um, Ambrose has de definitely given up, uh, given the whole uh, situation. Uh, but I'd like to say that um, I don't know about uh, North America because I'm seeing a lot of people here from North America. But what I think is that uh, you guys might open up your countries. You'll uh, go back to work. You will start. Uh, you know, you'll at least uh, go back to norm normalcy. But for us here, uh, we are easing restrictions, you know, we copy paste what you guys are doing up there or what the Europeans or other people are doing, but then it might not work. We might be in more danger, um, especially uh, with our, you know, with our uh, poor resources, for example, the facilities, the medical facilities, if you look at uh, uh, the health systems here, not just Kenya, but looking at the region, most of these systems are broken and um, you might open up, we might not really uh, open up, uh, but the need will definitely increase. Uh, if you look at our projects, we did not expect our projects to increase uh, as from March of this year. We didn't, didn't expect them to increase, but people are still uh, going ahead and starting new project. A project is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a team of 15 to 20 people coming together and uh, taking a piece of land and establishing a minimum of 40 beds. And uh, this is happening across and they need more support, they need more food, they want more, uh, you know, more technical know-how. Uh, we recently launched the Drive Institute, you know, it's an online platform where people can log in and get the notes, get the, uh, the knowledge, the technical know-how of how to, to do these things, which I think this, it's, 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 it's uh, timely. I think this was a uh, this godsend because uh, currently we can't travel. We can't send our uh, our oats, our organic agricultural trainers. We can't send our students. We can't send our um, our trainers out there. But then with this type of support, uh, these communities will grow, and um, you know we can support them through probably online platforms or calls or discussions like this one here, like the one we're having right now. But then. Uh, things are getting tougher down here. Uh, I'm not trying to scare anyone uh, because I'm, I can see my friend Joey is on this discussion. He likes to travel here. Uh, but then it's, uh, it's good to be open and to be honest. Uh, things down here, uh, things in this region, basically just let's talk about Africa. Uh, they're getting tougher. Thank you so much. I, I hope I've not taken a lot of time, but thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm done. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ambrose and Raphael, for sharing a little bit about what you've been experiencing on the ground um, where you are. So now we are actually going to open it up to a question and answer session. Um, again, if you have any questions about what Ambrose and Raphael have spoken about or just general questions about the organization, you can use the chat feature um, in Zoom which is might be at the bottom of your screen or the top, you'll see a chat button that you can click on and then you can type in your questions and we will get to them. So we've actually had a couple of questions come in. Um, so I will read them out and then direct them to Ambrose or Raphael to answer. Um, Raphael, I'll direct this one to you. Um, when do you think lockdowns and curfews will be lifted in your area? Um, if they aren't lifted, how will Thrive continue its work? Let me just unmute you for a second. Sure. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you're good. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, now this depends with the individual countries. Uh, for instance, uh, Kenya is, you know, easing the curfews by the end of this month. We expect by but probably by the last week of August, the president might announce that we are, you know, 
will no longer have curfews or he might uh, decide to extend. If you look at other countries like Rwanda and Uganda, uh, it seems that they might extend for another month or two. If you look, like, uh, if you look at Burundi, Burundi came in late. They started their curfews and lockdowns late, you know, after, after other nations had already closed down. Uh, I think when their president died, that's when they realized that this COVID situation is uh, becoming, uh, you know, a big uh, problem. So it depends with the individual nation. And then we also have counties and provinces. Some uh, counties and provinces can also make decisions to close down or to open up their, um, their you know, their, their, their areas, their regions. Essentially, we suspect that, uh, okay, we, we project or we forecast uh, a full reopening end of September, you know, or early October. That's uh, an estimated uh, date that is not uh, based on any facts, but it's just a uh, guess or an estimation. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, we have one for Ambrose. Um, would Thrive be interested in partnering with our public schools that have big ranches to grow medicinal food? And I'll add that um, they are asking which medicinal foods you are growing in Kenya, Ambrose. And then I'll ask, also ask you um, if they were, if someone was interested to partner with us, how would they go about doing that? Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the things I just want to mention here is uh, we are not limited to working with anybody. And like most of our projects, where we do our projects are in schools, orphanages, with communities, churches, hospitals. So when it comes to the public school, we are ready to partner. And right now, uh, if I'm not wrong, we have over, uh, let's say, over 30 schools that we are working with and they have these uh, 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 projects that we are working with or we are doing. And when it comes to partnering, it's just, Maybe when things comes back to normal, it's we can connect and uh, see how we can have someone near your area or somebody from here once the restrictions are lifted. And then we just come and train maybe some of the pupils or some of the students and also some of the teachers and show them how they can set these projects. Then moving forward, we can come up with ways how we can continue partnering and also expanding that project in, in, in your school. And uh, as the other question was about the medicinal plants that we grow, one of the things that we are talking about here, it's all about growing health. And when we talk of growing health, we are saying that let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. So in that garden, we can have different varieties of plants that are very good in fighting diseases. And apart from that, we have other good medicinal plants that can do well in such an area. And the best plant that we have used here at Drive, you see, like Artemisia that I'm talking about, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful plant that can do away with most of the disease when it comes to coughs, when it comes to arthritis, when it comes to chest pains, all those. And apart from uh, uh, Artemisia, we have Moringa though it does well in some areas and some areas doesn't do well. So we have Moringa, we have Hibiscus, we have mint, all those. You see, when we are talking about, uh, we have the four pillars, that is organic farming, we have nutrition, uh, natural medicine, and income generation. So when we set that project there, we have to consider all this. We have to consider once we grow our food organically, then nutritious food, foods that can fight diseases with high nutrients, then also medicinal plants that can do away with most of the diseases or can fight some diseases that are common in that locality. So uh, we, we, once we set that project, then we come up with a plan and say, okay, this is the best way that we can, we can move forward. Hope I've answered uh, your question. Thank you. Thank you, Ambrose. I think to add on to your answer, which was very good, um, is that for partnering organizations, you can always start the conversation with us by emailing us at info at thriveforgood.org. Um, and then also exploring the Thrive Institute. That is a great place.
place to start as you can try free trial and start learning some courses about what we teach. Since we do have the travel restrictions, we might not be able to visit you. So starting online is a good place um, to begin. Um, Ambrose, another question for you. Um, can you please elaborate and share more about food shortages in the villages? Why do you believe this is happening? Uh, yeah, I can talk about that. In most of the villages you find especially, uh, they are doing something we are calling like monocropping or the conventional way of farming. And like in this Western region, most of the people are growing corn. And you see corn takes almost uh, a year or nine months to mature. So you find that in between most of the people, if the stock that they had in the previous year just end, then they don't have anything. And the little that they have, they have to make sure that they, they have to make sure that at least it can push them for the next, before the next harvest is, uh, is ready. So, and also you see, uh, the, the, the system or the ways of farming that people are, uh, are practicing, that is the conventional way, the use of synthetic chemicals and fertilizers, you find that plants are not doing well. You find that they, they, they are growing in a big area, but what they are getting or what they are harvesting or the produce is very minimal compared to the organic way of farming, whereby you can utilize even the smallest area you have and grow different varieties of food throughout the year by using and following all the principles, putting in place all the principles of growing. So if people can go that way, and that's why I said like where I'm coming from in my small garden, people are starting to adapt because they can see that uh, I'm growing throughout, and the amazing thing is that one of them asked me, why, how, uh, how comes that you are growing without using chemicals? And you see, people have believed that you can't grow without chemicals. And you see, uh, sometimes if you want to grow and the, the, the crops that they want to grow need some chemicals and they don't have that, uh, uh, they don't have the money to buy like synthetic chemicals and fertilizers, they can't grow. But you see, in organic way of farming, it's friendly to the Farmer, you can grow using the locally available materials and any space. And by the end of the day, you find that you will have enough food throughout the year. Awesome. Thank you, Ambrose. Um, Raphael, I believe you want to say something as well. So let me unmute you. Go ahead, Raphael. Yeah, on that question, uh, you know, why uh, you know the food and uh, needs or the necessity for food is being uh, is increasing is going up it's because um, if you look at the rations that are being given by governments for example in Uganda uh, they're giving rations to, to 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 slums and in Rwanda you know to poor communities they're getting some rations from the government basically what they get is oil and cereals cereals include uh, maize you call it corn and uh, beans so. Uh, essentially, they also need some greens, they need some fruits, and uh, with the markets closed. For example, in Kenya, most markets are, are controlled. You can just go to walk into to, to a market, you know, to a vegetable market. Uh, in fact, some of the vendors have been closed because there are no customers. And uh, restrictions, you have to be, to be a few people in the, in the market. So there's no, market, there's no food in the market, and uh, the vendors are not working, definitely. So there's a gap. It's, that means that um, food from the farm, food from the community members will be, the need for that food will be increased, the demand will, will go up. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Raphael and Ambrose. Um, one question, as you're speaking about um, the gardens in your farm, um, Ambrose, does Thrive for Good dig wells? And if not, how are they getting water to what are these gardens as it's needed to grow their plants? Yeah, uh, one of the things uh, we are doing is that we are just trying to see that or the farming system that we are using, we, want, we, we, we are making sure that it is a system that everybody can just afford. And there are, as I said, there are some practices and some uh, principles that you have to put in place. For example, 
we are using, especially we focus on small scale farmers or small land. And one of the things that we, one of the principles that we use is uh, double digging. And when we talk of double digging is you dig two feet down and loosen that soil. And when you are doing something like that, it's you are create, like you are creating basins. So when it rains, it collects the water. Then during the dry season, it just releases the water slowly by slowly. And then when you build your soil, we are focusing here on building the soil. And that's what we have based on. If you can have 10% organic material in your soil or in your garden, you find that you can grow throughout the year. Because some, uh, what happens is, if you can incorporate more organic material and like compost, what happens is it acts like sponge. What do I mean like uh, working like a sponge? You find that it drains water or it holds water. Then when the plant is in need, it starts releasing slowly by slowly. And then apart from double digging, you can have different uh, gardens. You can have a keyhole garden or a vertical garden or a sack garden whereby even without rains or without much water, you can reuse the kitchen water or you can use gray water, whereby water from your kitchen or water from your homestead, you can just water your kitchen garden. And so that's why we are saying it is a system of farming whereby at least everybody can be in a position to grow. I understand some of the places are very, are very dry and maybe don't have enough water. But when you focus on, when you focus on organic matter in your soil, I'm telling you, you can be in a position to grow throughout the year. And also look, I've given you an example of uh, uh, kitchen gardens, like keyhole gardens, sack gardens or vertical gardens, and uh, also the double duck beds or uh, uh, double, uh, life gardens. So you have to see what best can work in your place. Maybe sometimes even you can go for, uh, for sunken beds. See what can work best in your, in your place, especially in hot areas or dry areas. Uh, keyhole gardens can work very well, but also remember what I've said, building the soil is the key point here. Once you build your soil, everything will just be okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ambrose. Um, before we go to the next question, um, for those of you who have just joined us, you can use the chat feature on Zoom, which is in the bottom center. You click on chat and you can type in your questions and we'll get Ambrose or Raphael to answer them. Um, but before we do that, some people are also asking if they could share a testimony or story um, that has changed their life and family. If you would like to do so, you can do that by typing it out in the chat and sharing it with everyone. Um, so thank you for doing that. The next question, Ambrose, I'm going to direct it to you first and then maybe Raphael, you can add on. Um, do you find that the locals who are used to eating nutritionally empty foods are open to adjusting their diet to include nutrient rich foods that are growing, or, that you are growing, or do they need to be educated about the benefits of organic nutrient rich foods before they're willing to incorporate these foods into their diet? So Ambrose, do you want to start? Okay, uh, I think one of the things is that uh, people have heard about organic food. And the only thing is sometimes people change to conventional way of farming. So they are not getting this organic produce, but they have that knowledge and they know the benefits. And one of the things I can say is maybe the availability. But what we are doing, for them to understand, we are creating awareness. And that's why we have all these, our oats and interns. And before, before maybe they start everything, I mentioned that we have the four, the four pillars, organic farming. After you have grown, it's not just a matter of growing. You have to know what you are putting on the table. What is the nutrient density of each food that you are growing? It's not just a matter of growing. Then once you understand that, then you can know which food you, 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 you are going to take. And I just want to give a, a, a story here. And of late, we came up with this issue of income generation. And we have some mini farms whereby even we have our stall just outside uh, our premises here. 
and people have realized the importance of this organic produce. And let me tell you one thing, once people have tested the organic produce, they don't want to go to the conventional or to the non-organic produce because they are feeling that there is, they are bringing a difference in their life. And a lot of testimonies. Uh, recently, I, ha I had a very good testimony that one of the person, and uh, before even he went there, he told me, you see, before these, non, uh, before these chemicals came, our parents used to grow food just without adding any chemicals, and people were growing healthy. And he told me that recently, they had just an issue that when they eat non-organic food, they have they have uh, stomach problems or they have some problems with their health. And since they noticed and they identified that we are selling organic food, that guy has never missed coming to buy our produce because he has identified or he has seen the difference. So you see, people know, they know, but sometimes, sometimes we can say ignorance sometimes and also availability of this organic produce. But once you know the secret, the secret organ of organic food and what it is bringing to your, to, your, to your body, then you are good to say, I'm saying no to non-organic food. But one of the things that we are doing is creating awareness. As we sell also, we are creating awareness and trying to teach people and telling them this is the way to go. Thank you. Raphael, uh, do you have you. anything to add to that? Yeah, sure. Um, Ambrose has put it very well. In addition, I would also say that uh, if you look at, uh, as Ambrose mentioned, or uh, on our pillars, we have the food security and have nutrition. Uh, right now, people are not even uh, uh, focusing on uh, basic nutrition, essentially. They're looking at uh, food security because these people are hungry. And uh, for poor communities, especially in Uganda and Rwanda, they have a lot of land, empty land. They have uh, enough rainfall. The soil is fertile. Farming organically is the cheapest way. It's the most affordable way you can, uh, you can farm. As in, you, you just need land, uh, take care of your land, uh, use it properly, you know, conserve, um, conserve uh, manure or uh, uh, conserve the, uh, the, your water. And then you can farm without even having extra, apart from seeds, you don't need to buy anything. You have the labor you in your community, in your family, and um, it, 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 it's, changing, uh, it's changing the ball game uh, because what we learn in school is to use conventional means of farming, use chemicals, use uh, labor intensive, use tractors and all these other things. But farming organically is cheap, it's affordable, and it's quick, and the land is available. So uh, it's, it's now increasing. The uptake of this type of farming is, uh, is growing. And uh, probably by the end of uh, next year, after this, you know, uh, situation that we are in, uh, more people in Rwanda and Uganda, especially, will have taken up uh, organic farming. Thank you. I think to add to that, um, from my experience, is that people definitely need a little bit of a mindset um, change. And that does happen through education, but they are open to it. Um, they're they're open to the education and what we have to teach them. So, um, Ambrose, to go off of that, why would people grow corn when it takes nine to 12 months to harvest when they could grow green vegetables and harvest it in 30 to 45 days? Good, thank you for that question. I think one of the thing is we are talking here of, like here in Kenya, the staple food is ugali or corn and people believe that the only thing that they can do or the only way that they can go and feel that they at least they are growing something is by growing corn and I think this has been something that has been said or something has been put in their mind that the only crops that they can grow and also give them money when it comes to selling is corn because it is the staple food. And uh, one of the things is even the people with small land, that's how they want to go. Because as I said, they feel that maybe we call it ugali here. You have to grow corn so that you can have ugali on the table. 
But this is something that we are trying to change people. And uh, the same question have been asked to the village where I have my, my garden. And they asked me, why are you not growing corn? And I have been answering them. I can't grow corn because if I have to wait for one year for me to harvest that corn and maybe I want uh, some money, then it will take me a long time. But if I grow this food, nutritious food, three months, I can grow like four times before you grow or before you harvest. So I think people, people sometimes, as I said, it is because of how they, they, they are looking things at. But once you start looking things differently and see and know the secret that if I grow this sh uh, uh, sh short, uh, short or uh, short or uh, short growing plants or they have short growing uh, period, then you can make more money rather than growing corn, which will take a whole year. Thank you, Ambrose. Um, as we're getting close to the end here, I do invite you guys to check out the group chat. There's some awesome stories and testimonies coming in um, from people that have been transformed by Thrive's teachings. I have also shared a link to the Thrive Institute website on the group chat that you can click and check out. Um, and definitely sign up to take the free four courses. Um, I think this is another one for you, Ambrose. Um, how effective are organic pest control techniques? I do know that in the Thrive Institute, we have a full demonstration video of how to make organic pesticides, and there's yep. a lesson on it. But Ambrose, can you just say a bit about that, please? It is amazing, and I just want to tell the, the viewers and listeners here that remember I did talk about growing your soil. And when you grow your soil, that the plant will get enough nutrients even to fight for these diseases and also some of the pests. You see, the, the, the technique that we are going, like companion planting, when we talk of companion planting, you look for um, the, how plants can benefit from each other. And like in the garden, how you set it, if you grow some repelling plants, they'll assist these, the other plants from being affected or being invested by, by, by pests. Then also the organic pesticides, they are very, very effective and very, not harmful to the environment. They are very, very good. So, for example, if you want to control aphids, you can use garlic and chili. So they are very, very effective. So very much effective. But remember, I'm still saying this, build your soil, have healthy plants, and these healthy plants, you'll find that you can even grow. Sometimes here at uh, Drive, we have the farms here, and it is very rare for us to go and even apply those uh, organic pesticides because we have built the soil, the plants look healthy, they can fight different diseases. So they are very, very effective and doing very well. Thank you. Thanks, Ambrose. Um, another one that I'll have you start with, Ambrose, and then Raphael, you can add on after it, is how is it having a family with kids that aren't able to attend school during COVID-19 or the pandemic? And are they being educated at home and how? So this is more of a personal, how are you experiencing COVID, Ambrose? So I think uh, it is a good lesson for, 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 for all of us. And for those who have kids right now at home, it's a bit challenging because I just want to give my own example. Sometimes I'm in work here. I just reside near the, 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 my working place and I have my daughters here. Sometimes they can come in the office here and they, like the younger one, tell me, draw for me this, I want to do this. So I've been playing that role of a teacher, a parent, and also a staff here. So, uh, but also one of the things the, like here in Kenya, the government is doing, we have some channels which have, uh, are, uh, are having these uh, lessons. And sometimes it is, uh, you can just sit and the, the kids can go through that with assistance of the parent. So sometimes you can't just leave them like that. So, and uh, 
so it, it has uh, it has really affected us in one way or another but also it is it is giving us time to know more about our kids and uh, we are hoping that once this uh, uh, pandemic is over things come back to normal at least the students will have learned more also from parents and they can they they'll do better when once they go back to school Rafael, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, definitely. I always have something to say. Uh, <laughs> I'm not married. I'm not married. I don't have kids, uh, but I have cousins around here. As Sabro said, they're quite stubborn. Uh, if you look at uh, there was a there was um there was a research done. I, I don't know which uh, foundation. I think it was World Vision. Ambrose maybe can talk about this. If you can remember the name of the foundation, we have an issue of teenage pregnancies, and uh, they're also forecasting that. Uh, because of this, you know, out of school period uh, from the start of the year and they'll be going back to next year, most young girls in uh, this, in our setups in Africa, in this region, or just across East and Central Africa, might not go back to school, which now um, will now be a bit bigger problem, you know, adding more firewood to the, you know, the fire. And uh, it's a big challenge, even though we hope for the best. Uh, thank you. And I think just to add something, I think most of the parents, we, we have a problem because it's like once we have the kids, mostly we leave them for, for the teachers or for, for the teachers. So you find that most of the time, the parents don't have that time with the, with the kids or with their children. And that's why, as Raphael said, there was that uh, research. And it's true. Most of the girls are being impregnated. And... Uh, most of the parents, and I can't say this, they are not taking care of this, their children the way, the way it's supposed, because it's something that we are, or most of them, they are not used to. And that's why I said we have to live with a new normal. And the new normal to this situation is we have to teach our children. We have to make sure that all the time we have our children, we are with our children. And the best thing to do right now as parents, and this is something even I'm trying to do with my kids, is to teach them the most important thing and the most important thing right now at drive is to teach even the children how they can grow their own yeah. uh, food organically and also teach them this 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 technique so i think that's the best way and also in kenya right now we have this cbc which is part of that at least kids are supposed to be involved in some of this work even in garden so uh, i think uh, that's something also as parents, they are supposed to look in one way or another on how they can go about that. Yeah, seventy percent of our seventy percent of our citizens in this region are young people between the age of eighteen and thirty-five. Seventy percent. So we have a lot of labor, you know. And uh, I don't know why we are uh, we are hungry. We have a lot of labor. We have a lot of land. We can do this. Thank you. Yeah, I think Amber, you're right on the. The point there is right now, the best thing that we can do is feed our bodies nutritious foods as there's no um, other protection being available quite yet against this virus. So the best thing that we can do is eat nutritiously and teach our kids to do the same so that they can build up their immune systems to fight such viruses and diseases. Um, we are coming to the end of our time here. Like I mentioned, we do have a few uh, minutes after 1 p.m. EST to go for some questions, but I'm not seeing any more come in. So I just want to invite Ambrose and Raphael, if you had a quick um, one to two minute testimony that has really stood out to you during your time with Thrive, if you would like to share that, I think that would be a really good way to go about ending our time together. Um, Ambrose, is there anything that comes to mind of a story? I just want to say sometimes when uh, you start doing something, and this is my own experience, when I started, uh, working or setting these gardens back in my home people were against it and they could see it was a waste of time but after some times the same same people who say that you are just filling graves and doing uh, zero work in your father's garden were the first people to come and get greens from the garden so sometimes even our staff in the villages they get such a uh, uh, they, they, they get such challenges. But one of the things is 
right now what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing from the people, because people are calling, visiting here and trying to say, how can we start doing such a work, which is very good. Sometimes let, I, I, I was doing this back home like 10 years ago and people were not really understanding what was happening. But right now, I'm happy that even back in my home, in my village, uh, people have started realizing the importance of growing the, 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 their own food and also eating nutritious food. And uh, I think one of the things that I want to say as I live here is that we need to challenge people and ask them, the food that you are eating, is it that the uh, quarter of the food, a quarter of the food that you are eating is keeping you alive or three quarter of the food that you are eating is keeping the doctor alive? That's the thing. You have to note that. You have to, and that's why I'm saying, let your food be your medicine. If your food can be your medicine, then there is no need of a doctor. You can be your own doctor by giving your food the right food with high nutrients. So I think lots of testimonies. And uh, I think you have been seeing, we have been sharing most of the testimonies. And we are glad that at least people are changing and we are making a change in people's lives all over Africa and in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Kerry, can I just give two short ones uh, quickly? Yeah, um, quickly, thank you. Uh, the, thank you. The first time that I went to a Kenyan prison, uh, Dale took us to, to the Kitale prison, you know, and it was quite interesting when uh, I joined and I never knew that you also, we, we, you know, the drive also has operations in uh, prisons, outreach in prisons. And the, if, you look at, if you look at the prisoners, what they do, you know, they farm, they eat what they farm and uh, you know they can get a balanced diet because essentially what the government provides is just you know cereals and porridge and now with the greens they can add to what they get there was this one prisoner from a uh, Kapenguria prison that's like uh, north eastern or northwestern part of kenya and uh he started gardens when he was you know after his time in prison i think he was jailed for about two years or 18 months then after his uh you know he, when he got back home, he went back home. He started farming, he started uh, gardens, and uh, he started selling. He, you know, he could farm, uh, you know, in about six to 90 days, he could sell his produce, then uh, plow back the, you know, uh, the profits to, and expand his, his gardens. And when we went to, with Ambrose to, to you know, to, to Kapenguria prison, even the wardens, you know, the officers in the prison, they were, you know, they were all, all of them were excited about what he is doing. He was supplying food to schools, to the market, you know, to, to the local hotels and restaurants. And that was, I was even, uh, I looked at myself, you know, I have some, some land, but I'm not doing anything with it. This guy is just out of prison with no, no tools, just his labor and a few seeds. And uh, he's, now, he's now a big supplier, you know, a big supplier in Kapenguria. That was moving, that was... Um, as a business, from a business perspective, from a, you know our income generation pillar, uh, that was good. And the other one uh, to sum, to wrap it up was the React Kenya Children's Home. React Kenya is a small children's children uh, home um, uh, a few kilometers from Kitale Town, and uh, they have about eighty to hundred kids who reside with them. Others probably are supported from wherever they are. And we started this project uh, with them. Um, I think their founders are Canadian. Their founders are Canadian. We started this project with, uh, with, with their manager, you know, with the children's home manager. And uh, they even sent reports. Uh, you know, from reports, you can see the impact. You know, when you go to the gardens, yes, you can see they have gardens, they have, they have these foods, they have these vegetables, they have the fruits, they have everything. But you can see the impact if you look at the kids. If you look at the photos, I was looking at some photos on, in my phone. Maybe I'll share them later. If you look at the kids when we started the gardens, when you were going there for the meeting to, to, to draw the agreement, you know, the MOU, uh, and you look at the kids after six months, you know, after starting the gardens and them taking uh, our foods, you can see a big difference. There was one young, one young boy who came from a slump just uh, near our center, and he looked very different. He, he was previously malnourished, but then if you look at him when, you know, 
uh, from uh, photos of uh, recent photos, he looks different. He looks better, and uh, some of these things cannot be seen unless you see them or physically, or you see a video or a photo. You see, uh, from the data we send, we don't give such impact. We can't measure, you know, if someone is underweight or he's now over. You no, know, we can't measure that. But the feeling, um, uh, you know, how you feel after doing this and assisting uh, uh, the team grow these things and um, changing from where they were to now being, uh, you know, being healthy, uh, working as a person working for Drive, you know, I think that is more satisfaction than any other one thing. And uh, it feels good to see that we can change with the resources that we have and uh, some extra external, you know, we can do more. And um, that's all. I don't want to take much time, but uh, I love what we're doing. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ambrose and Raphael, for taking this time to actually fully open up to all of our supporters here and share your thoughts and what's going on, where you're living. Um, we definitely appreciate it. Um, as well, I want to thank everyone else for taking time of their day to join us. We really hope you did enjoy it. Again, this is our first time and I think it went successfully. So um, if there's interest, we will definitely look at doing some more of these in the future. Um, if you still have any questions um, or think of some in the next coming days, you can always reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, or by emailing us at our email address, info at thriveforgood.org. Other than that, thank you again so much for joining us and being a part of this journey to help eradicate poverty and hidden hunger um, all over the world. We do invite you to check out the Thrive Institute online um, and share it with anyone that you might be connected to that could benefit from it. Thank you so much, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Nice seeing you, Ambrose. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, who? Evangeline. Evangeline, yes, Evangeline. <laughs> it's a long time. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Yeah. You look very warm. Yeah it, uh, yeah. yeah, it was cold here. It had rained for almost an hour. So even when we were starting, we still had some rain. So at least I had to to put on warm clothes here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can see Joy there. Hey, Joy, what else is going? <laughs> Joy's corner. You remember Joy's corner? I sure do. Do you want me to, uh, you want me to uh, come down there and drive the bus again? <laughs> Long time. Yeah. I think that place has been tarmacked. Have, have they tarmacked the place, Ambrose? If they were working on it, but still, still not good. Like today, we had some people who are removing a, a lot of mud from here because it is raining heavily. So, but at least now oh. it is not that bad. Yeah. Well, I, I can see a blue. Get up the hill again. <laughs> Welcome back to Kenya. <laughs> he says that he we would get stuck again. And who is Abdul? Yeah, Abdul would. Hamid. You would. Yeah. I'm seeing Abdul Hamid. Who is he? I didn't get a chance to meet him. Abdul, how are you doing, sir? <laughs> Hello. Uh, he's, 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 he's on mute. Hello? Yeah, he's on mute. Can, I, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, yeah. where, where are you located? Yeah, nice to you all. yeah this is uh, very interesting. Uh, nice to meet you all. You know, I'm very happy for attending for the meeting. All right. This is the first time for me to attend. Yeah, this is the first time for me attending like this meet. Like this, uh, you know, this, uh, this will be uh, like this meeting. So right. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm very interesting. I'm very interesting for this this kind of uh, you know very interesting. So I don't know why I can say this. <laughs> Nice meeting you too. James. Anyway, I'm happy. I'm happy to hear you. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you so much for coming. James Waller, you're so silent. 
Yes. Yeah, especially I would like I would like to say to Kerry for inviting the meeting. Yeah. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining. Yeah. Thank you. Ernest, are you there from Liberia? Let me see if I can unmute you. I think you're muted, Ernest. He's on mute. He's yeah, still on mute. He's speaking, but he's on mute. He's saying hi, but he's mm. on mute. I can read, I can read his lips. <laughs> Ernest, you'll have to unmute yourself. I can't. Oh, and we have, we have Denise. Denise, uh, hi, Denise. Hello. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here and can't wait to say hi to everyone. <laughs> All right, nice to see you. Now we can hear you, Ernest. Great to see you. Yeah, it's, it's so, so, it's, I'm sitting right at the front of Magari. You can uh -huh. see there? I'm at the front of Magari. Ah. And, um, yeah, it's beautiful. It's nice. Yeah, so, got a lot of stuff here. I'm just excited nice. and it's a blessing for me to be here. Thank you for the testimony, the learning, the experience that I got from Ambrose. And um, great job, great job. We got to get this thing going. The world need it. Africa yep. need it. Our economy are bad and we can't let it go. We have to run with it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Ernest. Denise, is that my brother? I can see my brother. Is that my brother? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's from he's from Ghana, Africa. That's my brother, as in yeah. from West Africa. <laughs> I have a baby from Togo also. Wow, thank you. Yeah. Where do you live? You in, in Accra? Where are you? No, I am from Canada, Toronto, but oh. I'm in Germany right now because oh. the baby needed to have brain surgery. Oh, so sorry. So we wish him quick recovery. Yeah, he's doing really well. Um, but I was in Ghana for six years, Togo for one year, and Haiti also five times. So I was always interested in uh, the organics for orphans when it was before Thrive for Good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Because Thank I you. noticed in the countries, in all of those countries, um, yeah. sometimes it's the mindset, like you were talking, a lot of people look down on farmers. And yeah. They don't want to get their hands dirty, That's... but then their health is very poor also. And the children, like Boaz, this is Boaz from Ghana. Oh, nice to meet you, Boaz. <laughs> Boaz. <laughs> he was, yeah. do you call it koshako? Do you yeah, know koshako? Yeah, yeah. yeah, we know it. It's a deficiency yeah. because of lacking proteins. I don't know. I'm, yeah, malnutrition. Think, malnutrition, yeah. Yes. Lack of, yeah, yeah. 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 So he was but, that, and then he contracted tuberculosis oh, because okay. his immune system was, was pretty much gone. Yeah, so, but now he's a very strong 11 year old yeah, boy. He, <laughs> yeah, he, look, he looks good. Yeah, we he feed him a lot. Like me. He looks just like me. He's my younger yeah. brother. <laughs> I just cut his hair too. His hair used yeah. to be very tall. And I You're just bald. cut it off. <laughs> You're bald, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much. And welcome to the journey now from Ofo to Drive. Thanks. I'm so happy for you guys, what you're doing and how you are so enthusiastic and you're an inspiration to everyone. Yeah. So we hope, good we health. Hope next... and... Pardon? Yeah, go ahead. We hope that next oh. day you come to Kenya. Oh, I think I would love it. Yeah, you <laughs> I <will>. always wanted <laughs> to. Ten years ago, I wanted to go to Kenya. Yeah. But God sent me on this other kind of wild path journey instead.